Does the world need deliverance? In fact, do you and I need deliverance? In the outline of prayer that Christ gave his disciples, he instructed us to pray. Deliver us from evil. In looking around the world in which you and I live today, is it conceivable that there is progress in delivering mankind from evil? Is evil diminishing year over year? Is righteousness increasing? Is the world becoming a better and safer place to live? Is God's Spirit the prevailing spirit on earth? Furthermore, is there a deliverer on the horizon? And here in America, will it be a Democrat or a Republican that delivers us? Now, deliverance is defined as the action of being rescued or set free. Now, there are segments of traditional Christianity that believe their mission is to win souls for Jesus, to encourage the lost or the unsaved to accept Jesus as their Savior today, before it is too late, because as a billboard stated that I drove by, at the speed limit, said, all of us are going to live forever. It just depends on where we're going to live. So you should probably choose now. It is as if God is competing with Satan to win the souls that are lost. Take an objective look at the world in which you and I live. If there's a contest between God and Satan, who is winning? Who is winning? <laughs> it's the bottom of the ninth. There's two out. I think God's last batter is up, and it doesn't look good for the home team, does it? If that's the case. Now, do you think if God set his hand to deliver the world that we would see a world far different from the world we see now? And, of course, here in America, to many, in many ways, I should say, we are insulated still from what the real world out there is. And in the church, it's almost like a cocoon. But evil is out there. We know that. It raises its head often, all too frequently. If God is now in the process of delivering mankind from the clutches of evil and the God of this world, how successful are his efforts? Is this the best that God can do? I think we all hope that there's more beyond this, that our God is more powerful than he would appear to be if this scenario is accurate. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Right after the temptation in the wilderness, Christ came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is in all likelihood a reference to the Jubilee, the 50th year, and a trumpet was blown on the Day of Atonement in the 50th year to announce the Jubilee. The reset button is pushed in that 50th year. I think we all know enough about the Jubilee to realize that it pictures a time when the whole earth will have that reset button pushed. What beautiful scriptures describing the mission of Jesus Christ, but the question is, did he fulfill that mission in his first coming? Well, to a certain degree, he did. He performed some miracles, didn't he? But if he was a deliverer, the deliverer we're really looking for why did he wind up in the grave? And where is he now? And does the world still need deliverance? Think about those things as we continue to introduce our subject this afternoon in 2 Timothy. Verse 3, uh, chapter 3, excuse me, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, and we, we all hope we're there, don't we? In the last days, perilous times, times of great stress will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. And after all that we just read, the descriptors describing the world in which you and I live to a large extent. And after all of this, in spite of all those characteristics, they still seem to have a form of godliness, but they deny his power. And from such, we, the people of God, are to turn away. Now, do you think that the people in the categories listed here really want deliverance? Are they looking for a deliverer or are they looking for more ways to make money, more ways to satisfy themselves? Do you think they want someone to guide and direct their lives? Do you think they want someone to reveal the laws and commandments of God to them if all of these descriptors are accurate? I tend to think that they're not looking for deliverance. They're looking for more opportunities to practice the characteristics that are described here. They're not looking for a deliverer. Our human nature does not want deliverance. Satan does not want to be delivered. He wants to continue his rebellion, and he wants to succeed at it. Our adversary has been very successful in promoting his agenda. And at the end of this age, as Mr. Burnett described this morning, Satan is going to be successful in gathering the world's armies to fight against Jesus Christ at his return. And it is at his second advent or coming and the succeeding time 
following that he will fulfill those verses in Luke 4 to their fullest, the quote from Isaiah, he will be the great deliverer. But resistance to that deliverance is going to be very strong. We know that. Now this day of trumpets helps us answer the questions that I posed just a few minutes ago. And it clearly underscores our individual and collective and desperate need for deliverance and a deliverer. So to discuss the topic of deliverance this afternoon, I'd like to begin by examining ancient Israel's exodus from the land of Egypt to see if we can get a clearer understanding of what God is doing now by examining what he did then with the nation of Israel. Because after all, as Paul wrote, all of those things that happened to them happened for our benefit, for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages have come. The history of ancient Israel mirrors the history of mankind in general in so many ways. One of the major themes in Israel's history, in fact, is deliverance. It all began when Joseph rose to power in Egypt and managed the agricultural production in the land of Egypt for those seven years of plenty, so that when the seven years of famine came, there would be food, not only for Egypt, but surrounding peoples and nations. And when those seven years of famine came, Egypt was the food source for the entire region, which included Joseph's family. I'd like to turn back to Genesis chapter 45 to that account. Genesis 45, verse 7. And God sent me, this is Joseph speaking to his brothers. This is one of the most beautiful and touching stories in all of the Bible. I don't know if I could have been half that gracious to my brothers. But Joseph was. In verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. He didn't blame his brothers. <laughs> he gave God the credit. And he knew that God had brought him to Egypt. Remember his dreams? They irritated his brothers, but his dreams came true. And there was a great deliverance for the descendants, the family of Jacob. And Joseph brought his family to Egypt. They settled in the land of Goshen. And in 400 plus years became a, quote, nation, unquote. We all know that story. But God obviously orchestrated this event to bring the descendants of Jacob into the land of Egypt in preparation for yet another act of deliverance, the Exodus. The theme of deliverance played an important role in Israel's history, and it will play an important role in the history of mankind. Consider for a moment the prevalence of this theme of deliverance in the books of the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. Now Moses and Joshua oversaw the great deliverance of Israel from the bondage of slavery in Egypt and their establishment in the Promised Land. We should note that the freedom offered to Israel from slavery in Egypt was not God's only purpose in delivering them. He also wanted them to learn to worship him as the only true God and to put away any other gods 
and become his people or nation. Notice this in Exodus chapter 5. Remember when Charlton Heston went to Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 5. Verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Deliverance. That they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And I wonder sometimes if we overlook this request that God made through Moses. It wasn't only freedom from the slavery uh, that they encountered in the land of Egypt and getting out of the job of making bricks. Of course, uh, being enslaved to sin is the uh, countertype of the Israelites' enslavement and subjugation in Egypt. But they were also called out into the wilderness to worship the true God, to celebrate a feast to God. So a restoration of their relationship with God was in order as well as their freedom. And they achieved the latter, but did they ever achieve the former? I don't know. I don't know that we can really say that their relationship with God ever became what it should have become. Israel's problem was not only enslavement and the need for freedom. It was also their enslavement to the wrong master. They needed their relationship with God restored. In fact, that relationship was shattered in the Garden of Eden. And the Israelites are not the only ones in need of restoring their relationship with God, are they? This world needs that kind of deliverance as well. Their deliverance involved physical and spiritual elements, just as ours does, and all of humanity for that matter. Now, God initiated this exodus of deliverance and engaged Israel in the process. They had their part to play as they entered the promised land. And one of the most perplexing issues that confront students of the Old Testament concerns the command to utterly destroy the inhabitants of Canaan, men, women, and children. The Israelites were to make no covenants with them, marriage or otherwise, or show them any mercy. They were to destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, burn their carved images with fire. Some wonder how a loving God could promote and endorse the total annihilation of the people of Canaan or the Canaanites. Now for Israel, it was a graphic and powerful reminder of the wages of sin, the wages of disobedience, elements in their lives that brought them into bondage in the first place. Did they realize that the same fate awaited them and their children if they fell into the idolatry and disobedience of the Canaanites? What a powerful and graphic message it must have been for the Israelite armies to eliminate men, women, and children, and all of the idols, and all of the temples, and all that pertained to the idolatry of the nation. Complete annihilation, which they never accomplished. In some cases, they made treaties and agreements with them. Uh, they did intermarry. They did embrace their gods. And, of course, later on, even under Solomon, uh, he had all kinds of different gods to satisfy all kinds of different wives and concubines.
consider. The Canaanites were steeped and immersed in idolatry. They worshiped a variety of false gods and goddesses. In some cases, they were sacrificing their own children to these idols. God owns the earth and all that is in it. And he promised the land of Canaan to Abraham and his descendants. The Canaanites had no claim on the land. God still owns all the land. The Israelites failed to eradicate the Canaanites from the land. And as God had prophesied through Moses, the Israelites made covenants with them, intermarried with them, embraced their idolatrous ways, and suffered persecution and oppression from the Midianites, the Philistines, the Hivites, the Perizzites, and all of the other ites of Canaan. They never really were delivered in the ultimate sense, were they? And you know, as you look at the history of the judges and the kings of Israel, it's nothing more than a repeating cycle of oppression and deliverance. Oppression and deliverance. In many cases, the oppression came from the various Canaanite tribes that Israel failed to destroy. And later in their history, when the nation divided, Israel and Judah oppressed each other. In examining the long list of judges and kings, not one of them was able to bring lasting deliverance, were they? None of them. Now, King David... He did a passable job. Others did a passable job. And when you look at some of the personalities of some of the judges, Samson uh, had a taste for Philistine women. <laughs> you know, God used imperfect people to deliver the Israelites on a regional basis, you might say, because the judges were located all over the land of Canaan. And different oppressions uh, raised up different judges. Deborah was raised up. Deborah and Barak worked together. Gideon, the mighty man of valor, who was hiding in a wine press. And the angel tried to convince him that he could do this. He took some convincing. But God took the time and the energy to work with these deliverers. And the kings were much the same way, good kings and bad kings, until the end of the period when they went into captivity. They started in captivity, they wound up in captivity. They were never completely delivered. Never. And nor is the human race completely delivered. In a way, we're still wandering in the wilderness, aren't we? Both Israel and Judah wound up being taken into captivity, engulfed in oppression once again. Note this irony. The people who enjoy the great benefits of God's deliverance from slavery, discrimination, economic exploitation, genocide, social violence, they eventually allowed all of these things to come back upon themselves in the centuries that followed. So despite the fact that they were delivered temporarily, all of those maladies, all of those dysfunctions came back upon them. They weren't, in fact, delivered, were they? Israel's problem is humanity's problem. Their own sinful rebellion their hardness of heart and stiffness of neck, their blindness to God and his multiple acts of merciful deliverance, their deaf ears when it came to hearing and understanding God's laws and commandments, and their inherited refusal to be subject to God and his laws. 
This attitude, this carnal mind, if you will, prevails among humanity today and was not restricted to ancient Israel by any means. Hence, God's lament in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29. This lament is universal for all mankind. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it may be well with them and their children forever. Now that's deliverance. That's forever. That's what God wanted for Israel. But Israel could not deal with the issues confronting them. They didn't have the Holy Spirit of God. The nation of Israel went from slavery and oppression to freedom in their own land with God himself as their God and King, and they went back into exile, slavery, and oppression. The lesson that we can learn from ancient Israel, there is no human solution to our spiritual problem, either individually or collectively. Our sins, yours and mine, and the sins of all of mankind have separated us from our God. No human deliverer can rescue and redeem us from the oppression and enslavement that have plagued mankind from the beginning as spearheaded and orchestrated by our adversary, Satan the devil. In Revelation chapter 19, we read this this morning. I'd like to begin in verse 11. This is what deliverance looks like. This is what our deliverer is going to do. Christ is our deliverer, our redeemer, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. This is what he will look like his second advent or his second coming. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and, on, uh, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called, or is called, the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Christ's first coming as a baby in a manger is not the same as he will appear in this case. And he is coming to take charge and to deliver the human race. For that has yet to occur. Deliverance for all of us has not happened yet in the fullest sense. Now in Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36, Verse 24, beautiful verses describing some of the actions that our deliverer will take. For I will take you, verse 24, from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. And of course, this is speaking primarily of the restoration and renewal of the nation of Israel, which will be a remarkable testimony to the world. Because you look at the history of this nation, who would want to repatriate 
that group of people, quote unquote, that kept going back into idolatry and would not listen, stiff-necked and rebellious, etc. God in his mercy, not because of their goodness, because of his mercy and because of his promise, he will set Israel up as a model nation. He will restore them. And Israel is a type of the restoration that God will offer to the entire earth, to all of mankind. It's a beautiful picture. And it really is effectively outlined in the story of the Exodus and in the story of the Israelites. I will give you, verse 26, a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them something Israel could not consistently do, something mankind has not consistently done. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. The land that was given to Israel's father, uh, fathers was what? The land of Canaan. Now what land did God designate for the human race. Was it the earth? Did Christ say the meek would inherit the earth? So the land of Canaan is one thing for the nation of Israel, but all the earth that God called very good at the end of the creation period in Genesis 1 and 2. That's the land that God wants to give to human beings. But he wants to deliver them and give them his spirit and put a heart of flesh that is soft and responsive to his laws and commandments and bind the adversary. And he wants to make conditions perfect for complete deliverance. What a beautiful picture. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. I think the weeds and the other problems that Adam encountered in Genesis 3 will be resolved. I can't wait. I am tired of supporting Scott's fertilizer. What a beautiful time it pictures. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees, the increase of your fields, so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. You're not going to be embarrassed ever again. Because after all, I am the great God. And that beautiful statement that Moses heard from the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob. I am the God of the living, not the dead. Who wants to be, who wants to worship a God that can't keep us alive? I mean, where, where does that take you? It takes you to the grave. God is the God of the living. What does that imply? Obviously, he's going to bring his people back to life. Every one of them. All that are in the grave will hear his voice. These conditions will be put in place. This is deliverance. This is not Samson. This is not Deborah. Now, King David will be raised up, and yes, he will rule in Jerusalem. He'll sit on the throne, but the 12 apostles will be there. Christ will be king of kings. And essentially, uh, it's a monarchy with the divine Jesus Christ as our king. Big difference. Huge difference. This is true deliverance. Verse 31. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. You know, this too is a part of deliverance. When you finally see 
and understand, as Israel will and as humanity will, what have we done? What were we thinking? How did this happen? That is true deliverance. Now, verse 32, not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Yes, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Yeah, that's healthy. A little guilt never hurt anybody. But thus says the Lord in verse 33, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate, and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. God is going to restore or deliver his entire creation from the bondage it has been enslaved in ever since Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. Angels with flaming swords stood by the gate to keep them from the tree of life, and their relationship with God was never the same. Here comes the restoration, here comes the deliverance, and it's brought by the great deliverer. On this very day, the day of trumpets, in its fulfillment. Verse 36. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, has spoken it, and I will do it. What a statement it will be to the nation surrounding Israel. Especially when the history of ancient Israel comes out and they realize how Israel treated God and now how God is treating Israel. How did mankind treat God, quote unquote, and now how is God treating mankind? These are the marks of a deliverer, a real deliverer. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock. Like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days, so shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Something Israel and mankind at large have never really known. Remember, it's one of the reasons God called Israel out of Egypt to reconnect them, to make a relationship with them. And when God brings the world under his control, this relationship will be established for the first time. And nations will see this example. They will inquire and they will want to what? Go up to the mountain and get a hold of what Israel has. It's a beautiful picture. Isaiah chapter 35. Verse 1. Speaking of all of creation now. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord the excellency of our God for the very first time. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. Good news to senior citizens. Yeah. 
Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. He will come and rescue you. He will come and deliver you. And when you consider the stress and angst and anxiety that exists in our world today, and in the hearts and minds of some of you seated here today. Do we need a deliverer? And is there any human that could deliver us from the evil that has surrounded us and encompassed us on every side? We all need deliverance, and this day pictures that day of deliverance. And that deliverer. Verse 5. Now notice this. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Now is this only a reference to people who are physically blind and deaf and now they'll have their physical sight restored and their hearing restored? Well, I have no doubt that that's part of it. But I'm suggesting to you that this prophecy is stating that as part of the delivering package, the deliverance that Jesus Christ will bring, eyes will be opened to see and understand God and his truth for the first time. Ears will be opened to hear. Hearts will be softened and opened. In other words, the door is going to be opened up. The blindness is going to be lifted. The curtain is going to be taken away. And for the very first time, humanity will be connected to their creator in a way they have never been connected before. And this is in the midst of the world in which you and I live, where there is a form of godliness, where there are people who believe that they represent Jesus Christ. The world has not been delivered. And there are a number of factors that are going to have to happen for that deliverance to occur. And this is a very important aspect of it. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb shall sing. So physical maladies will be a thing of the past, but spiritual strength and stamina and energy and the ability to understand and to put in practice will be there as it has never been for the human race, nor was it there for ancient Israel. And that's why they are where they are for an example for us to see and examine so we can understand more fully what is going on in the world around us and how we as the called out people of God have our eyes opened and our ears unstopped and we are lights and examples. And we will be used by God in a powerful and dramatic way to bring deliverance to this earth because we will live and reign with Jesus Christ. Yes, water shall burst forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool. And of course, water is a type of the Holy Spirit. And God's Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. It will fill the earth as the oceans fill the ocean beds. What spirit fills the earth now? It is not the Spirit of God. Imagine what it will be like. And here is the prophet Isaiah poetically describing, yes, a physical restoration of land and plants and agriculture, but also a spiritual restoration, a spiritual deliverance. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass, with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and a road. 
and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. God is going to make sure that the road to righteousness, the road to the kingdom of God is unimpeded. Have you ever been bowling? How many have been bowling? I've got to wake somebody up here. You've been bowling, good. All right, when I go bowling, I ask them to put those guards up <laughs> and block the gutters. That way I hit pins every time. You see, that's the way God's going to make this road. You won't be able to wander off. There won't be anybody holding a sign say, don't go that way. No, God doesn't mean that. God doesn't know what he, all of that is gone. All of that is gone. It's a different world. It's a world that has been delivered. Note the lion is not going to be there. That roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour? No. And the real lions are going to eat grass like oxen, but the spiritual lion, out of the picture. And who else can do that besides Jesus Christ? And there is no human deliverer that can accomplish deliverance like this. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Verse 11. I want to work my way into this series of verses. I think it's important because we're talking about the patriarchs. We're talking about uh, restoration, restitution, deliverance, the return of Jesus Christ, I want the linkage uh, to the patriarchs to be clear. It was here as Peter and John addressed the group, preaching in Solomon's portico. So let's listen in. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together, verse 11, to them on the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Now this is only a temporary reflection of what real deliverance is going to look like. Peter and John are in the grave. David is in the grave. Everybody in Hebrews 11 is in the grave. They can't deliver us. There's only one deliverer. And there's only one real deliverance. The God of Abraham, verse 13, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. This is how human beings and religious leaders in the first century dealt with our deliverer at his first coming. They murdered him. And that was part of God's plan. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Give us Barabbas. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. This is what you did. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. This is the source of the miracle. This is what restored this man or delivered him from his malady and infirmity. Yes, the faith which comes through him, that is Christ, has given this man perfect soundness and the present in the presence of you all. Apparently there was a slight Texas accent in those days. 
Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. You didn't know. Your eyes weren't open. Your ears couldn't hear. We know that. You know, oddly enough, even the disciples were confused, right, before the day of Pentecost. Well, what's he talking about? Bread. I thought we already bought bread. Well, how are we going to feed all these people? We got a couple of fish and a few loaves. What's he going to do? They didn't understand. But now they did understand. Each of us are going to rule over one of those tribes. So how soon can you get that done? And should I take my sword out now? Are we going to throw those Romans out now? And can my son sit on your right hand and on your left? See, that's where it was going. They, they didn't understand deliverance either. It took God's spirit. God's spirit has not been poured out. Now, we have access by the mercy and grace of God. But that time is coming. It's all part of deliverance. Verse 18. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So we fulfilled all of that. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of of the Lord. That's where deliverance comes from. That's the origin. That's the source. Repent and be converted. Verse 20. And that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. He's coming again. Whom heaven must receive. There's no other way. This is God's plan. Heaven has received Christ. That's where he is now, at the right hand of his Father. Until the times of restoration or restitution, or I'll even substitute the deliverance of all things created from the bondage in which they are in and the false God they are worshiping. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Now back to Moses. Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, speaking of Christ, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among your people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold of these very days. And it's interesting had you thought about Moses making this statement to the Israelites? God will raise up a prophet like unto me. And basically he's saying, you know something? You haven't really obeyed me <laughs> these 40 years in the wilderness, but you are going to obey him. And how is that going to happen? Because he comes in a manner and a fashion as we read in Revelation 19. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow. And every nation will eventually come under his authority and his governing power. You know, Christ's first coming, contrasted with his second coming, is quite a thing to consider. This time of restoration and restitution and deliverance was foretold by all the prophets since the world began. And notice, in the case of this prophet, verse 23, it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people 
is this not speaking ultimately of the lake of fire? And is this not a type of what God asked Israel to do as they went in to claim the promised land? Utter destruction, it was to reflect the ultimate fate of those who refused to obey and pursued idolatry. And all of the Canaanites that Israel dispatched at God's command will be what? Resurrected and lifted up. They too will be delivered. In Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, Verse 21, fear not, O land. Once again, I'd like to kind of view this as the whole earth, not just the land of Canaan. Canaan is a type. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, city of David. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And when you think of the plagues that are going to befall this earth prior to Christ's return, what a joyous announcement this is. The restoration of the productivity of the land, the return of rain, the return of crops and agriculture. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Sounds like your garden and mine. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, mercifully and kindly, amazingly so. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame, ever. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days as it has never been poured out before. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, a reflection back to the book of Revelation, the seals, the plagues, the darkness, all of that will come, but a new day will dawn. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not like today. Many call upon the name of the Lord, but where is the deliverer? Where is deliverance? It's not here. It's not time. God knows. The great deliverer will come. And it shall come to pass. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, among the remnant who the Lord calls. Yes, there shall be deliverance. 
I'd like to close in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation. Can you imagine the connection God has with all of creation? If he knows that a sparrow falls from a tree, how connected is he to everything in the created order? I can't imagine that. Can you? You know, the force being disturbed <laughs> when a tree falls or a sparrow falls from a tree? My. Can, can any of us grasp how connected God is to his creation and how much he longs and yearns for this day of deliverance? And it is coming. The earnest expectation of the creation. I hope we're all expecting it earnestly eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for we will have a role to play in that deliverance, in that rejuvenation, in that restoration. For the creation was subjected to futility. And that's the message of ancient Israel. That's the message of the former prophets. The book of Judges is often referred to as the book of failure. All of creation subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. God's sovereign will is going to be performed in spite of what human beings do. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption or decay into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Now that's deliverance, isn't it? For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. First century? Hopefully, we're at 10 centimeters and we're seeing that head crown. <laughs> right? Isn't that what we hope for? The whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Do we hear those groans and that sighing? In spite of our insulated situation and circumstance, do we hear, are we eagerly awaiting? Do we have earnest expectations? Are we setting aside the weights that so easily burden us and the cares of this world that distract us? And are we focused on the return of Jesus Christ and the deliverance of that hall of creation is groaning and waiting to receive. I hope that we can focus on these things. Verse 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, our final birth, our transformation as sons of God and the opportunity to join with Jesus Christ to bring deliverance to all the earth, to every human being. So brethren, as we celebrate this Feast of Trumpets, let's renew our eagerness, our anticipation to see this day fulfilled, to see deliverance finally come to all of God's creation.